So welcome everybody to this third um, Art History Orion online lecture. And it's uh, delightful to uh, be able to uh, introduce uh, my participants and I will uh, get onto that um, in a moment. But I want to first start uh, by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Marcus Milwright. I'm the chair of Art History and Visual Studies uh, at the University of Victoria. And we are um, pleased to be able to bring in scholars through uh, the Orion program, um, which is run out of the Faculty of Fine Arts, of which we are part. So today um, we are going to be talking to uh, Dr. Famida Suleiman, um, and I'm going to introduce her in more detail uh, later on. But uh, this session is called Islamic Art and the Museum, a Curatorial Odyssey. Um, also part of this event uh, will be uh, Dr. Atri uh, Hatef Naimi, and uh, you'll be seeing her later on. Um, she'll be moderating uh, the discussion and I'll introduce her again in more detail later in the event. So before we go any further, I would like to offer the territory acknowledgement. We acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose historical lands the University of Victoria stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships to the land continue to this day. And on a personal note, it's a, a privilege to be able to live and work in this beautiful part of the world. And it's a chance for, I think, all of us to think about our relationship to the land um, before we get started. So what we need to do now is to just think about the format uh, for this event. So what we've been doing with these webinars is to format them as discussions so that it gives us a chance to talk about you know, different issues um, that our expert speakers uh, are involved with. Um, and so we have in the first part of our event, um, a discussion, uh, which I'll be asking questions to uh, Dr. Suleiman. Um, and that will take us through to uh, about five o'clock or a little bit before. Um, and then we're going to move into a Q&A session. So uh, those of you who are uh, perhaps not so familiar with uh, the, uh, these uh, webinars, if you go to the base of your screen, you'll see a series of um, options. And if you look at the Q&A there and press that, you can write in questions there. So please feel free to write questions at any point uh, during the event. Um, and then uh, we'll have the opportunity uh, to uh, bring those four questions forward uh, for the, uh, the Q&A. So that's what we're planning to do today. And I'm going to introduce uh, Pamida in a moment, but I'm now going to pass on uh, the, uh, the mic, as it were, to uh, the acting Dean of Fine Arts, uh, Dr. Alana Lindgren, um, who will offer some words. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Marcus. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of my colleagues and our students in the Faculty of Fine Arts, it is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to this afternoon's Orion Lecture by Dr. Famida Suleiman. Established through the generous gift of an anonymous donor over 30 years ago, the Orion Fund in Fine Arts is designed to bring distinguished visitors from other parts of Canada and the world to the University of Victoria so they can share their talents and expertise with faculty, students, staff, and the greater Victoria community. The Orion Fund also makes it possible for fine arts faculty to travel outside of Canada to participate in the academic life of international institutions while establishing connections in order to encourage and foster future exchanges. Over the years, an impressive number of visitors have participated in this program and this afternoon, I am very pleased that the Orion Fund is making it possible to learn more about Dr. Solomon's impressive research. So welcome once again, and thank you for being here. I hope you enjoy this afternoon's Orion Lecture. Thank you, Alana. So it's my great pleasure uh, to be able to introduce um, Dr. Uh, Famida Suleiman uh, today. 
And so uh, just to tell you a little bit about her, um, she is currently the curator of Islamic art and culture at the Royal Ontario Museum. And this is also part of a cross appointment that she has with um, the University of Toronto, where she uh, teaches courses on art history. So she has um, a DPhil in Islamic art and archaeology um, with a specialism in Fatimid luster ceramics um, from uh, the University of Oxford. And she also studied for a Master of Studies um, at the same institution. She has a graduate qualification also from the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London. And her interests are very broad. Um, they cover Islamic iconography, Shi material culture, jewelry uh, from Middle East and Central Asia, as well as the arts of the Fatimid period. And that's a dynasty that ruled uh, predominantly in Egypt uh, between the 10th and the 12th centuries. Before taking on her role um, at the Royal Ontario Museum in 2019, she was the Philip Bishop, uh, Phyllis Bishop Curator of the Modern Middle East at the British Museum, and she held that post for 10 years. Um, and during that time, she was involved in the uh, Al-Bukhari Foundation for the Gallery for the Islamic World, and we're going to hear more about that uh, later in the event. And this is the, the new gallery for Islamic art at the British Museum. She has uh, many other um, exhibitions to her credit, including um, Adornment and Identity, Jewelry and Costume from Oman, and Life and Soul, Footwear from the Islamic World. And we're going to hear about, uh, perhaps later on, about her um, ongoing project, uh, which she started at the British Museum and continues to this day, on female sil silversmithing in the Do uh, Dofar region of Oman, which is a collaboration with scholars at the British Museum and the National Museum of Oman. She's also, in addition to her museum work, a very active scholar. And she's uh, the editor of uh, People, uh, People of the Prophet's House, Artistic and Ritual Expressions of Shia Islam, which was published in 2015, and Word of God, Art of Man, um, the Quran and its Creative Expressions, which was published in 2003. And more recently, she's the author of Textiles from the Middle East and Central Asia, Fabric of Life. And so we are delighted uh, to be able to um, have uh, Famida as our Orion speaker. And so now uh, we're going to move on to um, the questions. So. Thank you, um, Marcus, for that wonderful introduction. While I do my screen sharing, um, I would also like to acknowledge that um, my institution sits on the ter traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and that this continues to be home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples since time immemorial. Okay, so Marcus, shall I move on to the first question? Uh, yes, thank you. So um, I'll, I'll read this out. Um, in the second half of this discussion, we're going to move on to uh, look at contemporary approaches to the display of Islamic art. But I think it would be helpful if we start by establishing the principles that have defined the the design of exhibitions of Islamic art through the late 19th and 20th centuries. In this context, perhaps you can also reflect on the relationship between the academic study of Islamic visual culture and curatorial practice, and how this might have led to the marginalization of the arts of some regions and historical periods. Great, okay. Oh, I always do that. Um... So I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I just felt that we should address what is Islamic art. It is a problematic and confusing term, which was invented in the 19th century by Western European scholars uh, to categorize and make sense of art and material culture made by and for people who lived in or live in lands governed by Muslim rulers and oftentimes the inhabitants of these lands were or are predominantly Muslim. 
So it refers to the arts of all Islamic cultures and not just to the arts related to the religion of Islam. So it is not an equivalent term to Buddhist art or Jewish art or Christian art because it is not always art produced in the service of the religion of Islam. So it certainly includes mosque lamps and prayer rugs and Qurans, but there are also secular objects made for the palace or for daily life. So in a way, Islamic art is not confined to any specific era. It is not confined to any region. Uh, it is not necessarily religious art, and it could have been made by Muslims and non-Muslims. So just to give you an example is this beautiful folio from an illustrated manuscript of the Harivamsa, which is a genealogy of the Hindu Lord Krishna. Now this folio depicts a scene from Krishna's life in which he has a bit of a showdown with the god Indra, uh, who is the god of rain and thunder. And so Krishna is seen holding up an entire mountain, the Mount Govardhan, to protect the villagers from the rains sent down by Indra. This text of the Harivamsa and the great Hindu epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana were translated into Persian and illustrated for the first time during the reign of the Muslim Mughal emperor Akbar. So this manuscript was a project by artists of the Mughal court. So it, it is part of, and yet it is part of the genre of Islamic art in the broadest sense. So this is why I, I put this forward to you um, and we can talk more about this at Q and A. Okay, let's start with, the, with answering your questions now. Um, I felt it was important to discuss um, this right at the start in order to tackle your question. What were the principles that defined the design of exhibitions of Islamic art through the late 19th and 20th centuries? Because there were no galleries or museums of Islamic art in the 19th century, there was a thirst to explore to understand and to categorize material culture from the Islamic world. People like the British architect and designer Owen Jones, shown here on the plate on the right, and many others turned to the Islamic world for inspiration for their own designs. And at the same time, they laid the groundwork for the understanding and reception of Islamic art for the European public and in academia. So there was a tradition in the 19th century for mainly upper class men to embark on the grand tour. It was a kind of coming of age trip. So Jones, uh, Owen Jones at the age of 23, he visited Italy and Greece, but then went to Egypt and Turkey before arriving in Granada in Southern Spain. And there he carried out an extensive study of the Muslim Nasrid palace, the Alhambra which was a 13th, 14th century palace. And he studied it with a French architect called Jules uh, Rouri. They spent six months producing hundreds of drawings and plaster casts. Now, Gouri sadly died of cholera during their stay. So Jones returned back to London and published the results of their study. Um, you can see the beautiful image on the far left which was one of these amazing uh, paint, painted drawings uh, by Huri and Jones. So this was a life-changing experience for Owen Jones and many things happened in his career after that. He, he developed key principles for the newly established government school of design, which later became the Royal College of Art. His bold theories on the use of color, ge geometry and abstraction formed the basis for his seminal publication, The Grammar of Ornament, which was a design source book serving as a collection of the best examples of ornament and decoration from non-European cultures. And it is still in print 150 years later. His work also brought him to the attention of royal patronage, namely Prince Albert and Queen Victoria. And he was commissioned to direct the interior decoration for the great exhibition of 1851, 
okay, hold on one second. I'm just gonna, so if you look at the, the fantastic image in the middle, that is Owen Jones's recreation of the Alhambra Palace at the Great Exhibition. Okay, so what was the Great Exhibition of 1851? Um, it took place in London and these mid 19th century international exhibitions that happened in Paris as well, attracted millions of visitors. The one in London opened with great pomp and ceremony by Queen Victoria and Prince Albert and was held in Hyde Park in London in a prefabricated structure of iron and glass uh, which was dubbed the Crystal Palace. Titled the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations, the 1851 exhibition attracted more than 6 million visitors. That was three times the population of London at that time. And it involved more than 15,000 exhibitors. 50% 50 of the exhibit, uh, exhibiting space was devoted to British and empire products and the rest to products from overseas, which included ceramics, glass, furniture, and textiles, among other things. So what was the real purpose of these exhibitions in France and in Britain? They were meant to restore the manufacturing industries of these countries to their former positions of dominance in the wake of the political upheavals. And the 1851 exhibition was one of many initiatives to reestablish the position of British industry as the workshop of the world after a period of decline following the Napoleonic Wars. These exhibitions created a taste for Islamic art objects and massively impacted the art market so that portable objects flooded the auction houses and art dealers shops, which both responded to the new fashion and fueled it at the same time. I'll just point out these amazing spandrels. You can see the red, blue, and kind of yellow spandrels. This was, this was Owen Jones um, as part of his decorative scheme. Um, he only utilized the primary colors, blue, red, and yellow, and people were super critical. They didn't like it, but others thought it was interesting, but he was Im importing ideas from his travels in the Islamic world. Now, here's, I'll just very quickly mention another figure um, that was influential in the dissemination of Islamic art and design. He was the French archeologist, architect, and author, Emile Prise Daven. However, unlike Owen Jones, when Prise reached Egypt in 1827 at the age of 20, he was hired by the Viceroy of Egypt, Muhammad Ali Pasha, as the civil engineer. He immersed himself in the culture by spending many years living as an Egyptian, adopting not only dress, but customs and manners. He changed his name to Idris Effendi, and he learned to speak Arabic and converted to Islam. You can see the picture of him in the middle there. It's not, that's not a little dress up pose. He actually dressed like that. Um, when he returned to Paris in 1860, Pries brought back several hundred drawings, paintings, charcoal rubbings, photographs and plans, detailed notes of the architectural monuments and objects uh, of Egypt from all periods. Now, so for example, the paintings on the left and the right are by him. One of the disservices that Pries uh, um, sort of provided was his romanticization of the essence or the identity of Islamic art. He wrote that it was the Arab distaste for nudity that led to a desire to dress their material culture with decoration and ornament, which was devoid of any meaning. Other misperceptions pervaded Western European academia about Islamic art at this time, including the ban against the depiction of living beings, the Orientalist painters and photographers' obsessions of portraying fantasized harem scenes or scenes in the Turkish bathhouse, and the objectification of women in Islamic culture. These ideas profoundly affected perception and reception of Islamic art. Marcus. Marcus? Sorry. 
So um, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Good. Um, we talked up to now about Islamic art, but the term itself needs further examination. Um, it's often been noted that European derived distinctions between fine art, such as painting and sculpture and craft are not clearly defined. Indeed, displays dealing with the arts of Islamic cultures have often been dominated by media such as pottery, metalwork, woodwork, and textiles. In the design of their exhibits, what strategies have curators employed to deal with the diversity of Islamic material and visual culture? Um, and what are the sort of potential limitations of these strategies? Great, great question. Traditional displays of Islamic art in museums and galleries in the 20th century have created and maintained false hierarchies and distinctions between art and craft. This is a reflection of how Islamic art has been traditionally taught at universities. The arts are framed within structures of power politics and start with mosque and palace architecture of known rulers, archeology span of palace cities. Then we move on to manuscript painting by, un, by known artists. This is followed by ceramics, metalwork, and glass that is commissioned by important rulers and the elite. And then comes the rest. You will be hard pressed to find courses dealing with Islamic textiles more broadly, or embroidered textiles or carpets, which are so important in Islamic cultures. Same thing with jewelry, unless it is connected to a specific sultan or ruler, you won't necessarily learn about it. And when I refer to the Islamic world as taught in university or displayed in galleries, this usually refers to Muslim Spain, the Arab lands of the Middle East, which includes Egypt, the Ottoman lands, Iran, Central Asia, and if you're lucky, South Asia, but mainly for the Mughal period. There is usually no sign of Africa, nor Southeast Asia or Northwest China in the teaching curricula or in the galleries of Islamic art. Also, the time period covered in these courses and galleries is from about 600 AD to 1900 AD. It's as though nothing worthy of note was produced in the regions outside, outside these regions, nor after 1900. It's all downhill from there. You have entire cohorts of academics leaving their studies with huge gaps in knowledge and experience, including me. The reason I'm showing you this slide is because there are moments of surprise that disrupt this Western hierarchy of art and craft. The impact of Islamic art on the artist Matisse is well documented as it influenced the way he thought about perspective, the use of color, texture, and space in his paintings. Although he traveled to Algiers in 1906, it was the great exhibition of 1910 in Munich called Masterpieces of Mohammedan Art, the poster here on the, on the far left, that was the real turning point for Matisse. He made repeated visits to the Munich exhibition. This was followed by travels to Southern Spain in 1910, where he visited the Alhambra in Granada and the great mosque of Cordoba. And he began to realize the power of pattern surfaces to create a sense of space. He also traveled to Morocco in 1912 and 1913 and started to collect textiles and other artifacts for his studio. The work shown here is called, the one in the middle, is called Interior with Egyptian Curtain by Matisse, which demonstrates his desire to move away from Western European art styles of fully rendered forms and perspectives. You can see the Egyptian curtain in the photo behind Matisse, which he clearly used for the painting. So Matisse used Islamic art and craft. No, Matisse used Islamic craft and elevated it to art. Marcus, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's such an interesting process, isn't it? Because I mean, that applique work that you're identifying, I mean, later on he would do cutouts which really adopt the same sort of technique. And yet, you know, essentially that becomes fine art 
as we understand it. And so in a way, you know, these objects become mediated through artists like Matisse, you know, perhaps rather than being seen in their own right. Absolutely. Um, I'll show you the next image. So although arts from the Islamic world were collected in the 19th century, they were displayed in galleries of decorative art devoid of a geographical context. But here we have the first display at the Louvre in Paris, dedicated to Islamic art, which as you can see is very uniform and is mainly ceramic vessels and tiles and carved woodwork. So if you walked into this gallery, you would get a very narrow impression of what constitutes Islamic visual culture. What the image from the Louvre underscores is that the impetus for collecting objects from Islamic lands during the 19th century, usually through art dealers in London and Paris, was for their decorative appeal, which was ignited by their first appearance at the World Fairs, like the Great Exhibition in London in 1851, or the Universal Exhibition in Paris in 1855. So all these all happened in the mid 19th century. Individual collectors were also inspired by Orientalist paintings, Bible tours to the Holy Land, and the industrial art and design movement. Thus, these works were displayed in galleries of decorative art, and scholars such as Frederick Duquesne Godman, shown here, collected these works because they not only appealed to them visually, but they represented a missing link the missing link between the arts of antiquity and the Renaissance. Now, Godman was not a scholar of Islam, but of natural history. He was a well-respected or ornithologist and president of the Geological and Zoological Societies and vice president of the Royal Geographic Society. He cultivated a passion for Islamic ceramics after visiting Spain and Turkey. He started to acquire Islamic ceramics from the London art market, and he donated a few examples to the British Museum during his lifetime. But the bulk of the collection remained at his home in Surrey in, in South London and was displayed in specially made cabinets lining the walls of his home. Following his death, the collection remained this way until the death of his daughter Edith in 1982 when the Godman collection of 600 pieces of Ottoman pottery from Iznik, Persian luster, and Hispano-Moresque pottery from Spain, examples which I show here, was bequeathed to the British Museum. So the point here I'm trying to make is that museum collections are a reflection of individual collectors and their tastes. Okay. So Marcus, your question, how did curators grapple with the limitations of their collections on the one hand and the false hierarchy established by the art market and academia between Islamic art and craft? So I'm showing you an image of the Islamic art gallery at the Royal Ontario Museum, uh, which was on display from 1982 to 2005. The curators sought to create a more accessible display that provided cultural context to the objects. So, for example, on the top right, they created a kind of souk or market where you would go and see the potter, and then you would move on to see the metal worker, and then you'll move on to see, um, you know, someone making felt. Um, there, were, there was a fountain with a courtyard. You see a lot of pointed arches that are reminiscent of some type of Islamic mosque architecture. Um, and I think, you know, although uh, visitors loved it, like for example, the very large image there, it, you see a woman wearing uh, a red and white um, dress from Ramallah, from Palestine. Uh, uh, you know, hand embroidered dress. And then the lady on the on the right, she's wearing a Bethlehem style, almost wedding dress. Um, but then you see this, um, the textile on the back with these very large red carnations, that's very much 
Ottoman Turkey, very urban, whereas the dresses are more village and town. There is a mishmash of things going on here. Um, the mashrabiya, the, the kind of the beautiful screens at the back made of wood probably came from Egypt. The, um, the chest and the cradle at the front um, with inlaid mother of pearl may have come from Egypt or Syria. So it was an attractive kind of uh, an exhibition, but even in the, in the case of the bottom right, you have the metal workers workshop. Um, there is a hodgepodge of material there. Some of it is from Iran, some of it is from Syria, some of it's from Palestine. So the issue was all of the Middle East was kind of collapsed into one homogenous cultural landscape, but also it felt frozen in time. Now I'm going to show you, and we can talk about this more, you know, if anyone's interested a bit later, but here I'm gonna show you, you know, talk about the pendulum swinging completely the other way. So this is an image of the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, in Qatar, which opened in 2008. It is a royal commission sponsored by His Excellency, Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa Athani, and the project is considered a cornerstone for the state of Qatar in its establishment as a global capital of culture. I got that from the website. The building itself is a work of art and was designed by I.M. Pei, taking inspiration from the 13th century Sabil or ablutions fountain of the 9th century mosque of Ahmed ibn Taloun in Cairo. The permanent gallery ex exhibition includes around 850 artifacts with two floors of gallery space dedicated to historical periods. So therefore it's grouped also by dynasties and themes of Islamic art spanning the eighth to the 19th centuries. So once again, a clear cutoff in time period. The museum reflects the manuscripts, you know, they have manuscripts, ceramics, all kinds of things but it is really governed by masterpieces. Everything, every single object is a masterpiece and therefore every single piece merits its own case. Um, do you notice the object labels in the case? I don't think so because there aren't any in this particular photograph because you were meant as a visitor to commune with that specific object and just marvel at its artistry. You weren't necessarily meant to make connections with the people, with the makers, the, the use of the object. It's a very, very different experience. Okay, on to question three. Great, thanks so much. Um, I'd like to move on now to your own experience as a researcher and curator at the British Museum and now at the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, could we start by looking at your work at, uh, on the Al-Bukhari Foundation uh, Gallery of the Islamic World at the British Museum? The design of this space represented a radical shift in the way the British Museum had approached the display of Islamic uh, visual and material culture. Um, could you tell us about the goals of this new gallery and the practical ways in which you and your colleagues at the British Museum sought to engage with different audiences um, through strategies such as the placement, the creation of narratives and the choice and placement of objects. Absolutely. Okay. So for those of you who, who haven't had the chance to visit the British Museum before 2018 or after 2018, these are the two galleries um, that represented the Islamic world. The one on the left is the John Addis Islamic World Gallery. And um, it had a lifespan of almost 30 years. That's a very long time for any gallery. And the one on the right is the newly built one. Uh, it opened in October, 2018, and it's called the Al Bukhari Foundation Gallery of the Islamic World. Now, before I move on, I just want to mention the names of my curatorial colleagues. This, was, this project was obviously made by a huge number of people, but there's no time for me to mention them all. But I would like to mention that I was part of a fantastic curatorial team, which included Venetia Porter, Z uh, Ladan Akbarnia, Zaina Klinkhopper, William Greenwood, and Amadine Mera. The gallery was designed by London-based Stanton Williams, and the architect in charge was Sanjay Godke. 
So let me take you through that, trend, that project. So the John Addis Gallery, as you can see there, it was, it was um, an isolated gallery kind of at the back of the museum. So people enter through the through the, the colonnade at the front. So in order to get there, you had quite a bit of a walk. Um, meanwhile, the new gallery, the Al-Bukhari Foundation Gallery, you can see that it's brought all the way to the front. And not only that, it is in between two other important galleries, the medieval European galleries to the, to the left, and then the Renaissance galleries over to the right. This was really important for us as moving the location of the gallery was um, helped to show that Islam, the Islamic world was connected to other regions through exchange of ideas, peoples and cultures. It was part of world civilization and not just an anomaly of its own. Okay, now the, the Addis Gallery was a much beloved gallery, um, but it displayed the Islamic world as it was taught at universities. Okay, so it, there was a geographical split. Everything on the right of the gallery was from the Eastern Islamic world, Iran, Central Asia, and India. Everything on the left of the gallery came from the Western Islamic world. So the Arab lands, Ottoman Turkey, mainly, yes. The other thing is it was led by dynasties. So you would walk up to a case and it'll say, these things were made during the Ayyubid period, or this, the, this material is from the Mamluk dynasty. And then within the case, objects were grouped by media. So all the ceramics together, all the glass together, all the metalwork together. It was great for teaching. Imagine being a university professor and you want to teach people about Islamic metalwork or um, painted enameled mosque lamps, you came to the British Museum. Now, um, time period, it stopped in the 19th century, up until recent times when Venetia uh, Porter actually introduced a lot of modern and contemporary art in, rot in a kind of rotating exhibition space in the middle of the gallery. And then we also, Ladan and myself and Zena, we also um, played around with that temporary exhibition space. And we included Islamic art objects with ethnographic, you know, 19th, 20th century material, works on paper, mix, we mix things around. This is where I did the life and soul footwear from the Islamic world um, little display as well. Okay, so, before we embarked on the plan for the new gallery, we wanted to carry out a number of focus groups because we wanted to get people's impressions of the Addis Gallery and what they liked and what they didn't like. We also conducted focus groups after when we put together the, the, the design for the new gallery. And then finally, we had more focus groups once the museum, once the gallery opened. So here is what our um, our visitors said, they said, the location of the Addis Gallery means that it is, it is easily overlooked. Someone said, and a few people said, once you've seen one ceramic pot, you wonder how many more you can see. Now, come on, Godman gave us 600 and he was only one collector. So yes, we did, we did show off the ceramics a bit. The collection is beautiful, but the gallery lacks atmosphere, character and spatial clarity, ouch. Teachers want clear highlight objects in cases to structure their visits, including modern objects and art help visitors relate to more recent times. There, were, there was a lot of feedback there for us. The other thing we did was we did our homework. Just have a look. Within a span of a decade, between 2004 and 2014, there were 12 brand new museums or brand new galleries, complete refurbishments, partial refurbishments of Islamic galleries and museums around the world. So this is, was a huge, basically you could see the trend, people, people, you know, this was also after 9-11 in 2001, and there was a lot of interest in Islamic culture 
and Islamic religion and material culture generally. So this created this wave of renovations. So the British Museum you can see there is at the tail end in 2018, and the Museum of Islamic Art in Berlin is, is still ongoing. So what we did is we visited some of these places, but we, we got a lot, of, um, a, a lot of advice from our colleagues at these other museums. They were able to tell us what worked, what didn't work. The other thing we did is we wanted to create a visitor centric experience. So this is a this pie chart represents the visitors in the museum. Now in 2017 there were about 6 million visitors. I know that that's drastically reduced because of the pandemic, but the, really the British Museum has never has anything less than 5 million visitors a year. It's massive. The Royal Ontario Museum has you know, uh, one and a half million visitors a year, for example. So you can see the difference. Of course, the British Museum is free of charge and London is one of these destination um, cities. So this is, I'm not gonna read all of these out to you, but what I'm gonna point to is the little 4%. Experts looking for more detailed information made up 4% of our visitors. So you couldn't, you shouldn't be writing labels and curating an entire gallery for 4% of your visitors, right? You have to focus on the families, the self developers, and the tourists, the sightseers, okay? Everyone had a different need and we had to try and find a way of um, meeting their expectations and their needs. Okay. So after all of this, we, so we consulted fo focus groups, we consulted other museums and colleagues there. We had an academic advisory group, so they, they fed in as well. Um, obviously, we consulted with the patron of the, of the gallery, the Al Bukhari Foundation as well. And this is what we, we consulted with our colleagues within the museum and also our own core curatorial group. And we came up with these goals for the gallery. We were going to present the cultures of the Islamic world from West Africa to Southeast Asia and China, everything in between, emphasizing the global nature of Islamic civilization far beyond the Middle East. We were gonna use the full breadth of the British Museum's collections from the seventh century to the present day to deepen visitors understanding of the diversity among Muslims, as well as the engagement of non Muslim peoples in the Islamic world. So we weren't just going to look at the collections in the Middle East department that we took care of, but we went to our colleagues in the European department in the Asia department in the Africa department and said, we need your help, we need objects from you too to put into this gallery. And most importantly, we wanted to connect the objects to people and places to provide a strong sense of human context for the art and material culture and explore questions of identity, nationalism, and globalism. Okay, don't get overwhelmed by all of these um, neon colors, please. What I wanted to show you is the gallery is kind of in the, in the shape of a T. So the first part of the T is chronologically set for AD 600 to 1500. And then you walk through the door and I, th I think I can do this. I can do a laser pointer. This is the medieval European gallery. You walk through the door and you come to the medieval Islamic gallery. And then you walk through this door and you have all of the material from the, the, the year 1500 to the present day. We have something called the hands-on desk manned by a volunteer every single day who takes out objects that people can handle because we felt like we wanted to give people that experience as well. Not just looking at things through cases, but touching them. We still maintained our temporary exhibition space. This is where we could have storytelling and other things but we could have rotating exhibitions to make things exciting and fun. And these, these cases in the middle, the L-shaped cases, as we call them, they focused on chronology and geography. Every, we wanted our visitor to feel grounded. Every time you, you walk through there, you knew where you were in the world and what period of time. 
this is what people asked for, especially the teachers. Other people said, we just want bite-sized information and themes. So we created thematic um, displays along the perimeters of these walls. They were all thematic. And we had an entire wall of textiles, um, which I felt very strongly about. We had works on paper, things that you had to rotate out every six months, calligraphies, painting, drawings. And then we had a huge, we had a pretty big section for contemporary art as well. So I'm gonna show you pictures now. I'm just checking our timing here. Oh geez, I gotta move fast. So this is the kind of entrance. Um, and notice that there isn't a, a clear cut divide between Western Islamic world and Eastern Islamic world. We avoided that. Every case you came to, you had, for example, this is the case for Egypt, the early part of Egypt, 10th to 12th centuries. You had a mixture of things. You had very, you know, priceless uh, rock crystal and gold jewelry, but you also had bread stamps. You also had dolls made of bone. Um, you had material uh, like this tombstone that uh, spoke about a woman who passed away and what her genealogy was. We, we introduced a lot of female voices. Um, we also included um, text that was in a foreign language, for example, Arabic or Malay or Persian. Um, and the reason we did that is because we wanted people to stop for a moment and say, wait a minute, I don't recognize that text. What does it say? And then you were supposed to look down here and you were supposed to see what the translation is. This one, Misr, um, Umadunya, you know, Egypt or Cairo, the mother of the world, uh, because it was so, um, multi, it was so multicultural and it was a global, global city. Similarly, I mean, this is a lovely quote as well. Um, I'm just gonna read it to you so I don't, uh, mess it up. It is, um, it's from the incense burner, uh, one of these incense burners below. And, um, and it says, uh, inside me is the, is, the is the fire of hell, but outside are the perfumes of paradise, because obviously you have heat and fire on the inside, and then the perfume uh, comes out. Um, we also had places to, to just sit and contemplate so that you didn't you weren't constantly on the run and and you could take some time to, to digest things. Very important for us were object histories because clearly everybody thinks that the British Museum has looted the entire empire and brought everything back and everything is illegal there. And so we wanted to dispel that misperception. Sure, there are some things that are have shady um, legality and you know th th those, those conversations are also happening, but we wanted to say that it was a bigger story. So every object in this case had a story behind it. What was the provenance of this particular object, for example? We also included materials such as this, which were acquired in consultation with the countries themselves. For example, the Omani earrings here, or the, the beautiful amulet from Tajikistan. These were, these were acquired as part of our diplomatic relationships with these countries, which is a far cry from how initial things were, were put together. Um, this material here was picked up by a British soldier in Afghanistan and brought back in the 19th century. Um, and the reason he did that was because the entire building was being blown up and he could see little fragments on the ground and he brought it back. And we thought it's important to explain how these things showed up. Um, every, not almost every case, you'll find a little object on the, on the floor here, here and here, for example. These objects were for children or younger visitors to enjoy as well. Um, this, let's see. Yeah, this case here more, more very quickly about new visual culture, where we talk about, you know, it's more of a kind of teachable moment where teachers can come with their students and say, well, what is Islamic art? Let's talk about different aspects of Islamic art. But we also talk about um, iconoclasm, the fact that some people took offense to figural images and therefore they chipped off the heads of these birds. 
Um, you know, and this tile when it was made, no problem at all, but someone at a later time took offense to it. And we, we really talk about these, these um, issues. Um, again, you know, we, we've, we've put this beautiful Kyrgyz headdress next to a Palestinian headdress, putting together East and West together, but also right in the middle of this material that we are so-called fine art, uh, you know, children's clothes here, a, a child's clothes from Iran, um, a Turkmen child's um, tunic from Turkmenistan, um, textiles everywhere. The gateway object. So you know, you know how the teachers wanted something or even tourists, they just wanna see something very quickly and move on. And so we said, okay, if you, if you read this label, it'll talk about this object and it'll give you the theme for the entire case. So if you have to run, then at least you'll get something out of it. Um, and of course we expanded the breadth from Africa to Southeast Asia. So we had an entire side of a case related to Southeast Asia and another side related to Africa. Um, we, here we have, you know, shoes, for example. Here we have um, living craft traditions from Gujarat. Um, this is, we have music, we have shadow puppetry. Uh, when you pick up one of these, um, one of these headsets, you can listen to um, Ahmed Mokhtar, one of the greatest lute, uh, lute players in, in London. Uh, you can hear him playing this lute. And here is all the contemporary art as well and the works on paper. Okay, and, and we worked out fine for us. We were worried, we were so scared, uh, but people really liked the display. So I think, yeah, that's great. So I know I'm a little um, slow here, but we finally got into the last question. Well, thank you, Fermi I mean, I think it's well worth sort of seeing that gallery in detail. And um, I, I can certainly recommend if you are in London, you know, do take the time to uh, visit it. It's really an exemplary example of, you know, how to display not just Islamic art, but, you know, that any, any culture where you have that sort of breadth of um, media and approaches and so on. So um, we have a last question um, here and it's uh, to finish our discussion. Could you talk about your own journey um, and what you think are the roles and responsibilities of a curator of a collection of Islamic art? Um, and can you share some examples of how you've engaged with museum visitors and what you've learned uh, from these exchanges? And lastly, how do we contend with the dangers of cultural appropriation in the design of exhibits? So for me, my journey has led me to this point where I feel like we have to make our collections relevant and by showing them in a different way, but also finding ways of collecting to bring fresh perspectives on modern material, um, including modern craft, contemporary art and objects of daily life. I'm giving you an example here. These ma face masks, these COVID face masks were created in 2021 by Yazdan Saadi, who is a graphic artist who lives in Iran. And he wanted to um, encourage mask wearing in Iran. So he painted a series of Shahnameh face masks. And in it, the hero Rustam, this, this wonderful bearded character, he has to go through seven trials. You know, he, he, he kills a, a dragon, he fights a witch, um, he's stuck in a scorching desert, which is the one on the top top left there he's and then he finally you know a goat leads him to a pond of water he almost died from thirst and finally he kills um this uh rather comical looking white demon and this is um this is a painting from the 15th century at the royal ontario museum just a detail of it of rustam killing the white demon now so the shahnameh has been illustrated for centuries and centuries. And Yazdan took the language of the Shahnameh and he converted it into, imagine these demons as the coronavirus, morphing into one sinister form after another. And why can't we be Rustam? Why can't we channel our inner Rustams and fight the coronavirus by wearing a mask and social distancing and all of those things? And I just thought, I've got to buy these masks for the Royal Ontario Museum. Like imagine putting these on display, which I am going to, by the way, in September. 
uh, if you can make it to the ROM then. And this is, this is where I feel like let's make, let's, let's offer new stories and fresh perspectives and, and build bridges between new material and historic material. Community outreach and diplomacy, again, I think are very big on my list. In the British Museum, I took a team of British soldiers who were heading to Iraq on a tour of the old Addis Gallery to give them a crash course on Iraqi heritage and material culture in about 2008. And that was a really kind of chain, well, kind of sort of life-changing experience for me because I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm really a pacifist and I kind of, you know, I have my own opinions on the war in Iraq and so on. And I was really nervous meeting these soldiers, but when I met them and I took them around, you know, they were, they were full of awe and they were full of respect and they wanted to go there equipped with some cultural context. And they were able to get that in the Addis Gallery just from talking to me for an hour or so. And I feel like we need to do more things like that. I had a session with a, a group of homeless people when I did um, the exhibition on Omani jewelry and textiles. And again, it was, another life-changing experience for me because I was very nervous to talk about um, luxury textiles and luxury jewelry to a group of homeless people. But when we started to speak, it's clear people understand value, they understand ceremony, ritual, all of those things, um, protection when you're wearing an amulet, for example. They, we made a lot of connections there. And I feel like the museum should, should not be for the elite. It should not be for people who have studied art history. It's gotta be for everyone. It's gotta be for, for everyone in society and they need to come in there seeing a reflection of themselves in order to, in order to engage with the material. I think that's my biggest job. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much how I'd like to answer that question for now. Great, thanks. That's a, a really uplifting uh, way of uh, finishing, and uh, uh, it's it's wonderful to see these uh, face masks um, because uh, you know it's a reality that we're having to live with at the moment. But of course, it will become a, a historical thing, um, and and to keep these you know sort of objects which could otherwise be thrown away, um, it, I think is so important. Um, and you know we, we will treasure them as we go forwards. Um, so uh, we can probably um, if we uh, Stop share? Yes, we stop sharing the screen uh, now. Okay, hold on. There we go. So, so we have an opportunity now to uh, go to the um, question and answer session. So I'm hoping that uh, people will take the opportunity to uh, write some questions in the Q&A. So again, just to remind people, you'll find that down in the bottom, um, or bottom bar of your screen. So if you press that, it'll bring it up and then you can uh, write there and uh, we'll be able to see those. Um, so I'm going to now um, introduce uh, Atri, um, who's going to be uh, moderating the questions. Um, so uh, Dr. Atri Hataf Naemi, um, and you, you'll, be able to, uh, you'll be able to see her in a moment. Um, she is uh, currently a sort of postdoctoral researcher, um, and uh, she completed her PhD uh, here in the Department of Art, History and Visual Studies in uh, 2019, and I was very uh, fortunate to have the chance to be able to supervise her um, on that project. And she's been working um, on the culture of the Ilkhanid period in Iran, as this is from uh, 1236 through to 1335. Um, and it's a really crucial period, um, and the Ilkhanids are a Mongol uh, dynasty. And it comes at a period where we see an enormous amount of uh, cultural transmission across Asia. And so she's been uh, concerned with particularly urban life and urban uh, design um, during this period and looking at, you know, the interactions between a sort of per indigenous Persian culture and introduced elements uh, that came about as a result of the Mongol period. Um, so she's held uh, fellowships with the Aga Khan program for Islamic architecture in MIT um, and also the Barakat uh, trust uh, in Oxford, and uh, she's uh, now currently back in uh, Victoria and is um, continuing work on her book, um, which is uh, we're all looking forward to seeing, um, which will be about uh, the Ilkhanid, uh, this sort of Ilkhanid urban enterprise. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, 
uh, put you both on uh, spotlight so that you can Okay. 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 Thanks very much, Marcus, for the generous introduction, and thank you very much, Dr. Solomon. That was a very fascinating talk. I enjoyed a lot and learned a lot. <laughs> uh, now we have about uh, twenty minutes for questions, and um, I would like to invite the audience to write their questions in the Q and A box. As Marcus mentioned, you usually find the box by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. But before we um, start the question, I would like to use my privilege as the moderator and uh, ask the first question. Um, Dr. Solomon, when we talk about curatorial practice, uh, we often focus on portable art objects. Um, in many museums, architectural fragments are also treated like art objects. Although they can be safely kept, repaired, and displayed in the museum, and taking them out of their original context and exhibiting them as separate pieces may largely distort their meaning. I would like to ask as a curator how you have faced the challenge of displaying Islamic architecture in the museum. It's a really good, really good question because other, if you don't introduce architecture in the curatorial narrative, then you're missing out on the full context of, of, of a, even an, of an object, where it was made, how it was used, um, and so on. So, and one of the, th and I don't have the best, you know, I don't have the perfect answer for you because there have been many, many experiments on how to do this. I mean, I showed you this, the, the uh, slide from the Royal Ontario Museum, where they imposed Islamic architectural styles, um, which they were invented in a way. For example, the arched uh, entrances to the souk or the courtyard. Mm -hmm. um, I think the trouble is we, we, we want to avoid creating a pastiche of Islamic architecture. We don't want people to go away thinking any, any part of the Islamic world you go to, you will find a courtyard with a fountain with a pointed arch. We want to still emphasize the diversity of the Islamic world and architectural styles. One of the ways we, we address this at the Al Bukhari Gallery is we have a lot of ceramic tiles. And we have them mainly from, um, from Iran. So we have a lot of cross star and cross luster tiles, which would have probably lined the walls of um, important um, shrines in Natanz or, or other places in Kashan, for example. And so what we did is we, we put those tiles um, in the display as though they, you know, as, as they would be found. We didn't separate them. We, we kept them together um, in, their, in their groups. And similarly with the Iznik tiles, we had a lot of, lot of tiles from Turkey, which, you know, they're beautiful tiles that, that are used on, in palaces and mosques. And again, we completely lined the wall with, with these Iznik tiles. But the way we were able to explain, you know, we had a label and we explained where these things came from, but we had a kind of video monitor which showed you the buildings, the types of buildings in which these tiles would be shown. So that was, that was our, it was our compromise really, is to, kind, is to be able to show images of where these, where these tiles would have come from so that the monuments were brought in that way. Another thing we did is um, we commissioned, I think, do you remember the, the slides I showed you with these amazing benches with these jolly screens? Yes. Right. So we commissioned those from a fantastic des Saudi designer called Ahmed Angawi. Mm -hmm. so he made those screens and um, they're called Mangur. In, his, in the Hijazi tradition in Saudi Arabia. They have many different names, but the Mangur tradition is an ancient one where you take, 
pieces of wood and you don't glue them or nail them together. You just interlock them. And they're really beautiful. One is called, you know, the, the, the lover and the beloved, basically. Mm -hmm. And so we commissioned a group of these, um, these screens, but we didn't ask him to create a replica of the types of screens you would see in a 19th or 18th century house in Saudi Arabia, which is where that the tradition comes from. No, he designed them in such a way, he used a lot of, a lot of mystical or Sufi um, kind of symbolism behind them in, mm -hmm. in terms of the openings, how big the opening openings were, how small they were. And he said, these are the lungs and this is the heart and this is the one that represents the mind. And um, so we, we introduced architecture in a different way, in a more contemporary way, still wanting people to feel like they're in a different gallery. There's a completely different ambiance when you enter from the European gallery into the Islamic one, but we didn't want to include domes or minarets or, or, or point, you know, tile arches because we didn't have a, well, we do, we do also did have a very large Safavid tile arch, which was put there, but that was our compromise in terms of how, mm -hmm. we, how we represented um, architecture in our gallery. Thank you. Thanks very much. I got my answer. And um, let's just start with the audience questions. So um, I'm going to read the first question. They thank you for your wonderful talk and uh, uh, for your discussion on museum practice. And they ask, uh, to what extent do the BM galleries discuss Islam itself? For example, differences between Sunni, Shia, Sufism, or specific teachings from the Quran, transmission of Islam, etc. Yes, good question. So we grappled with that um, question in our minds as well. We didn't want to give the impression that people who aren't familiar with Islam or the Islamic world, we didn't want to give them the impression the first case they see is about religion and that'll then color their experience throughout the gallery. So we took a step back and we included a case with the Quran, with, but a Quran from West Africa. So we wanted to already introduce the diversity in Islam. And we talked about the message and divine revelation and what is the Quran and so on. And in the case next to it, we talked about the Abrahamic faiths. So we looked at Islam from the point of view of um, a monotheistic religion um, that has many similarities between Judaism and Christianity as well. So we included an amazing Iznik dish with um, the virgin and child, for example. Uh, we included a Torah pointer from Central Asia, um, but we included um, uh, a, a beautiful amuletic coin with the hilia, with a beautiful description of the Prophet Muhammad. So we talked about uh, prophethood, we talked about monotheism, we talked about a divine revelation. We included um, a compass that pointed towards the Qibla, towards Mecca as well, uh, in order to talk about prayer and, and ritual practice. But we didn't create a case that had the five pillars of Islam, for example. Mm -hmm. um, Sufism and Shiism came up naturally. They came up naturally in different topics, particularly when, we, when you go to the, the case with a lot of Safavid material, we were able to talk about the Safavids. When you, entered, when you went to the first case related to the Caliphs of Cairo, of course we had to introduce um, Islam, uh, as Sunni Islam and Shia Islam in there as well. So, even in, the, even, even in the Abrahamic case, we talked about the difference between Sunni and Shia. We had a, a huge panel uh, pal from Palestine, which had the four caliphs, including Imam Ali, and we were able to talk about Sunnism and Shia Islam that way. So, so we decided to take that approach. Right, okay, thank you. Thanks for the answer. And the next question, they again, thank you for the detail and passionate presentation and ask, uh, could you say something about how you would uh, approach textiles and custom in terms of not just uh, showing off the final product, but aspects of their production around the Islamic world? Good, 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 good question. Thank you for that. 
Um, so we did it. What we did, for example, we were very, we were very keen to show production and also technique, whether it was ikat weaving or embroidery. But in the case I showed you, that was from South Asia. I know you saw some shoes there, and then you saw you saw South Asia. We um, block printing in Gujarat is interestingly. It's, it's, it's run by Muslim families. So people wouldn't even have realized that in Gujarat, in Western India, there are Muslim clans, generations of Muslim clans mm -hmm. making a specific type of block printing. And so uh, we spoke to the artisans and we were able to not only get the finished product, but we, uh, we bought the blocks themselves and we asked them to make a process set for us, which is basically strips of fabric where you see the process, the, the you know, every single moment of that block printing and how, how the pattern and how the color and the dyes all develop. So we, we did try and do, we tried to do that as well. Textiles, we could only show them in the second gallery, even though we had early medieval textiles, there was too much natural light because we wanted to flood the first gallery with a lot of natural light. So we weren't able to include, for example, Abbasid or Fatimid Tiraz in the first gallery. So really the conversations around textiles happened in the second gallery where it was a lot darker. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the next question, and uh, again, thanks uh, for the talk and for your insights about the development of the gallery. And they, are interested to hear more about uh, what types of uh, public outreach programming is taking place or is planned uh, focusing on the exhibition? Has it been feasible to use public programming to promote the principles that inform the exhibition choices? So um, I should mention that I left the British Museum as soon as the galleries opened in October 2019 because I had accepted the job at the ROM. So I wasn't um it's hard for me to answer that question because i haven't been there i do know that uh the british museum they have a lot of very interesting programming around what happens in the gallery for example um when there is um a new installation of contemporary material there is always uh, a kind of weekend program around that there are films there are discussions um Anytime there is a special like no ruse, you know, the, the Persian New Year, we have, uh, I remember we have entire weekends around that, um, which then introduce people into the gallery as well. Um, the whole idea of the uh, rotation space where we have temporary exhibitions was to have music recitals, storytelling, and, and things like that. But unfortunately, because I left, I can't give you specifics on on what was done. I know the whole the whole impetus behind that gallery was for for public outreach. So, yeah. Right. Thank you. And we have one uh, question about uh, contemporary Islamic art. Uh, they asked um, if you faced any challenges while selecting contemporary Islamic art, uh, which is not limited to one medium. How do you anticipate the future curation, curatorial uh, practices for contemporary Islamic art? We have, we, we are limited. Well, when I was at the British Museum, we were limited in the kinds of uh, contemporary material we could purchase because we had to come up with a strategy and a strategy includes storage. So the main impetus behind the collections of contemporary art there are 2D works, works on paper or painting, but also it branched out into photography. I know that just before I left, um, Venetia was able to secure some video as well. Um, we have smaller objects, for example, material made, um, made from ceramic that we are able to easily store. And so, um, as a result, that contemporary material, because it's mainly works on paper or, 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 or photographs, they have to be rotated every six months. Uh, and so that's a big job. Um, even with the textiles, 
uh, technically the textiles have to be rotated every, I think we managed to, to put them on display for two years and now they're gonna be rotated again. So that's the nice thing about the gallery. Uh, but also um, contemporary art is not limited to the gallery. Um, there is, I don't know if it's still on, but, but certainly recently, uh, Venetia Porter put together a kind a, an exhibition, an entire exhibition in one of the temporary exhibition spaces at the British Museum, where you you I suppose you buy you purchase an extra ticket to see, and, and it was it was kind of a retrospective of everything that's been collected at the British Museum in the last <laughs> few decades. Um, I'm hoping. Uh, I remember I collected a few textile objects there as well, made by contemporary artists, and. Um, I've started to collect material here at the ROM too, mm -hmm. textile and, and works on paper as well. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's something that really draws audiences and it's so relevant. Yeah, thanks mm -hmm. for the question. Thank you for the answer. And let's go to the next question. Uh, how do you work with a display mode that uh, adopts a non-hierarchical approach to material and visual culture? but also organizes exhibitions around key or central ideas that visitors can distill and take away with them. Yes. So there is, you're right, there is sometimes a danger in putting everything and the kitchen sink in one, one display case. And I felt that when I went to visit some of the other museums um, in different parts of the world, where right next to, um, you know, right next to uh, a 10th century Quran, you have something, you know, an amulet that was made only, only last week. And, and I, I, you know, and I can see, I can see the trouble with that. Um, It's really, it's really, for me, it's really a case of the respect that you give to that particular object. So the respect that you give to a pair of shoes that were hand embroidered and constructed in a workshop for a groom, for example, I feel deserve just as much respect as a beautiful blue and white dish and um, from, from 16th century Iran. And I, I think it dissolves the hierarchies. Like you, the audience, the visitor will know that, okay, this thing was made from ceramic and was made in the 16th century and obviously took a long time to, to shape it and to, you know, to paint its decoration. And okay, here is, here is um, a shoe that I could picture someone, someone making um, and would have been less expensive, like value, right? You could, people understand value and how much something costs. And so that, we're not trying to hide that. We're not trying to say, you know, everything is a work of art. Um, everything has, you know, meaning to it. And is, 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 is you know, everything has, has, how can I put this? It's, 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 it's okay, I feel, to, to put material near each other, side by side, if they, if they talk to each other. So it was fine to put the Kyrgyz headdress with the Palestinian headdress. They're both from the 19th century. They both have precious coins and pearls and corals next to them. And they both were both worn by, by brides, a Kyrgyz bride, and and uh, and you know a, a bride from from Bethlehem and I just so I'm able to tell those stories I'm able to put um, a photograph of a bride wearing a similar headdress and then give the explanation um, I just I feel like that's that's okay that the juxt making those sorts of juxtapositions are 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 fine I I wouldn't um, I wouldn't try to make false I don't want to make artificial connections just for the sake of it. I think you still have to be true to the story of the object. I just don't think you need to take all the 19th century material and put it in storage and lock it up forever. Like I, I feel like you need to bring it out now. It's time to, to embrace that material as well as 
material that was made for Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. Mm -hmm. That has a place too, obviously, but you know, I can, they can sit near each other side by side and look just as beautiful, light them properly, give them a beautiful mount and hey presto, you've got a great and interesting, an interesting display. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Thanks for the answer. Uh, I think we have just two minutes. <laughs> so I'm just going to uh, read the, we don't have uh, enough time to cover all the questions, but I think uh, we have a note. It's not a question, but I would like to read it for you because they like to convey their appreciation for a uh, Genuinely stimulating talk, and thank you for flagging so many of the challenges and problems areas to do with uh, uh, curation of the, of the, the non-Western art, but particularly Islamic art. They wish we could have had a longer talk with you. <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully in, in the near future. But just to, uh, we have just, uh, yeah, um, time. I'm just going to check the time and we have just uh, one more minute. So our time for the question is uh, almost uh, over. Just to uh, wrap up uh, this section, I would like to ask one uh, final question. It's a very quick question, but uh, I'm asking it anyway. So um, Dr. Solomon, museums have definitely increased uh, public awareness of traditional crafts across the Islamic world. Uh, while traditional manufacturing practices have been negatively affected by different social, political, and economic factors, in your experience, how could museums contribute to the preservation of the crafts which are in the danger of being disappeared? You know what I'm going to do? I know we're not supposed to do this, and Ma Marcus is going to scream his head off in a minute, but I just have these three slides to show you about craft. Mm -hmm. And this is my project on the female silversmiths of Southern Oman. So the lady on your left is um, Tuful Ramadan, who is, you know, in she's in her 80s there. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, Ghalia Albas, who is also in her 80s. And we met with the Women's Association of, um, of Taka, which is one of the one of Salala and Taka are the main kind of cities in southern Oman. The, you know, it border they border Yemen, Dofar, the, the southern region. And they have this unique tradition of female silversmiths. Now it's a it's it's really always the males who, you know, men who do the silversmithing, but this is a very unique tradition. And so what we're trying to do is we've gone back there we've interviewed them, we've documented their tools, which you can see here, um, and we've looked at their fi the, the, the fine products that they've made over the years. And we've even spoken to young uh, silversmiths that they have trained to find out why they can't carry on with this tradition, because it's very tough for them to. It's a very highly competitive market. People want gold jewelry, um, you need a lot of outlay to buy raw silver and then create products. So it's, it's a tradition that's vanishing very quickly. The museum cannot revive a tradition of silversmithing, female silversmithing in Oman, but we can raise awareness about its existence. We can connect it to our existing collections and we can put them, you know, we can put an exhibition together. Um, this is to fool. And this is the, look at how fantastic the pieces she has made in her life. Mm -hmm. She's dressed her granddaughter in all of this material because just to show that, you know, um, Omani women, they, they dress, they, they wear jewelry from head to toe really. Mm -hmm. And this is how diverse the material is. And this is just a, a final picture of us documenting like to fool, she had serious cataracts. She was waiting for her appointment for her cataract surgery. And yet she was able to work with a doming block and make little silver beads for us that we could record. So we are going to have an exhibition on this silversmith at the British Museum in December this year. Mm -hmm. And so we will be able to, sh to shine a light on the tradition We've spoken to um, the ambassador of Oman in London to explain our project and just to say, look, this is Omani heritage. Either you step up and help out or, or you know, things will fizzle out. And I think 
that's pretty much that's pretty much what the role of a museum is. We can't we can't come as a Western museum and say, hey, this is a really important tradition and you don't you can't let it die. You know, I mean, that's that's not our role. That's that's inappropriate, in fact. And so here here's my very short answer to to that question. And I hope um, Marcus forgives us for, for uh -huh. up extra time. But um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was very interesting. I'm happy that you <laughs> answered that. Thank you so much, <laughs> Dr. Solema. <laughs> That was a very interesting um, talk. And now I will pass the microphone to Marcus. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. And um, I mean, that was a, a wonderful discussion. And um, apologies to anybody whose question didn't uh, get uh, answered this time, but uh, I'm sure that uh, if you uh, email Famida, she'd be happy to kind of uh, talk to you further on um, some of these things. So. Um, uh, in, in wrapping up, uh, I mean, I think that that last uh, slide, those last slides, I mean, show just how you know relevant you know, museum curation can be. You know that that we can, as as Famida was saying, not revive a craft, but be it, be one of the sort of um, means by which it actually becomes appreciated, and that this potentially, you know, can uh, help to revive or, or to allow it to kind of develop in all sorts of different ways. So um, in wrapping up, I'd like to just take the opportunity to um, thank uh, those uh, both involved and then also those behind the scenes who have made this happen. So um, first of all, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, the help of the Dean's Office in Fine Arts, um, who uh, do a lot of the groundwork to allow these uh, sorts of talks to happen. And also um, to uh, the Art History Office, Sandra Curran and uh, Barbara Biggs, who um, have done an enormous amount of work on this. And also um, just to thank uh, Mike Houston, uh, one of our technical uh, people in fine arts uh, for kindly kind of taking me through some of the uh, ways of running a webinar like this. And I hope you'll forgive me for any of the infelicities in, in my technique uh, uh, that have come about this time. So lastly, of course, um, you know, I'd like to thank uh, Atri for uh, moderating uh, the questions. Um, and uh, a huge thank you to Famida for bringing um, you know, these, uh, these stories about what she's been working on and giving us such a, a rounded sense of you know, what uh, the curation of Islamic art means in, in the contemporary environment. Um, and so last of all, I'd like to thank all of you, the audience. Um, you know, we are hugely grateful uh, to you to, uh, for uh, coming to take part in this event. And we're hoping to be able to do more of these um, in the fall. So um, thank you again, and uh, we hope you all have a good evening.